life will become difficult towards the end. Challenges will come, disasters will come, catastrophes will come. The earth will be covered in injustice and in wars and in battles. And you see that today. Look at the Arab Spring, look at Syria, look at Africa, look at what's happening there in Russia. Mankind is becoming more and more unstable and unhappy and miserable and in difficulty and in turmoil. And when the earth is covered with injustice as it is going towards that direction, the Prophet ﷺ gives us the glad tidings of a righteous ruler who will come. Now about this righteous ruler, the Prophet ﷺ says he will fill the earth up with justice and peace as it was filled with oppression and wrong. Good days will come after these difficulties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to lift this ummah from its absolute misery and feeble state that it is now. He's going to lift it back up to its victorious, honorable state, back to its nobleness that it once carried, this ummah. From once being united to our disunity today, it will return back to the unity. It's going to return back to its glory. It will become the leading nation of the world in every sense of the word as it once was before and even better. And with regards to this ruler, a thousand and fifty ahadith have been narrated, of which four are sahih. The Prophet وسلم, at his time, one day he came at Dhuhr to the masjid and started to speak about the signs of the end. That this is what will happen and this is what will And he وسلم, spoke from Dhuhr until Asr. And then they gave the Adhan for Asr. They stood up, they prayed. The Prophet وسلم, stood back up and started to speak again from Asr until Maghrib. And in that way he continued and the Ashab say he mentioned and went through every sign and we remembered what we could remember and forgot what we forgot. So amidst those signs that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, he mentions this hadith. And I want you to listen to it carefully. And the Prophet ﷺ says, تَكُونُ النُّبُوَّةُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونَ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَن يَرْفَعَهَا Prophethood will stay amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izza wishes for it to remain. Then Allah Rabbul Izza will lift up prophethood and prophethood would be no more. And we knew our witnesses that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Prophethood was lifted and prophethood is no more. So Ya Rasul, what will happen after? Prophethood. So he said, ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً رَاشِدًا فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونُ ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَن يَرْفَعَهَا Then will come the age of the rightly guided khulafa, the rightly guided khalifas of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They will reign amidst you so long as Allah Rabbul Izza wishes for them to reign. Then Allah Rabbul Izza will lift up the reign of the rightly guided. Ya Rasul, what will come after them? ثم تكون ملكا عادا فتكون فيكم ما شاء الله أن تكون ثم يرفعها الله إذا شاء أن يرفعها. Then will come an age where rulership and leadership is passed within tribes, as in it will become tribal or it will become legacy and lineage based. This king, the son of this king, one will hand bullet to the one after them. فَتَكُونُ فِيكُمْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَن تَكُونُ Then this age will stay amidst you so long as Allah Rabbu Al-Izza wishes for it to stay. Then Allah Rabbu Al-Izza will lift this age up from amidst you. ثُمَّ تَكُونُ مُلْكًا جَبْرِيًّا Then will come a tyrannical rule, an oppressive rule. And it will last amidst you so long as Allah Rabbu Al-Izza wishes it to last. ثُمَّ يَرْفَعُهَا اللَّهُ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْ يَرْفَعَهَا Then Allah Rabbul Izzah will lift up this age when he Azza wa Jal wishes to remove that age. Then what will come after this age of tyranny and oppression? Listen, O Muslims, and glad tidings to you. ثُمَّ تَكُونُ خِلَافَةً عَلَى مِنْ هَاجٍ نُبُوَّةٍ Then will come the age of the rightly guided Khalif who will lead in accordance to the teachings of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And with regards to him, he is famous amidst us as the Mahdi. Literally in Arabic, Al-Mahdi means in English, the awaited one and the anointed one. So the chosen awaited one. 
And the Mahdi, some scholars say he's born now, and others they say not yet. The minor signs make it a possibility that he probably is right now here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The Rasul says, Al Mahdi min itrati min waladi Fatima. The Mahdi is from my lineage, as in from my progeny, from the children of Fatima. And then he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, His name will be my name. So his name will be Muhammad. And his father's name will be my father's name. So he will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And as the earth was filled with wrong and oppression, he will fill it with justice and peace. So the age of the Mahdi is an age of intense struggle. And the hadith says he will stay with you for seven years and maybe eight. And if it really extends nine years and this righteous ruler Ali radiallahu anhu says, Al Mahdi minna ahl al bayt. The Mahdi is from us, from the family of the Prophet. Yuslihuhullahu fi layla. Allah rabbul izza will prepare him for the office of leadership in one night. So the Mahdi doesn't know he is the Mahdi. And the Mahdi doesn't have the competencies of the Mahdi until one night. In one night, Allah will transform him. The ahadith mention that a king will die in the Jazeera, in the Arab Peninsula. And the sons or three sons of a king will fight and quarrel over leadership. And to avoid this quarrel, this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, will leave Medina in secret and go to Mecca. Because he doesn't want to be involved in the conflict, nor does he want people to turn towards him. So when he goes to Mecca, his aim is to avoid getting tangled up in this leadership struggle. Yet people follow him from Medina into Mecca. And they find him and they take him out. And they bring him to the Kaaba. And there between the Durukn, as in Hajar al-Aswad and Maqam Ibrahim, they will make bay'ah to him when he doesn't want it. And as soon as they have pledged allegiance, two things will happen. Number one, an army will march out from Syria to attack this progeny of the Rasul. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, listen carefully, is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. And he is asleep. And in his sleep, he starts to move. He looks uncomfortable. He's displaying what he's never displayed before. Discomfort and sleep to the extent that he's moving. Then he got up. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have seen you do what you normally do not do. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Strange is the situation. An army will come from Syria, intending the house of Allah, from my ummah, seeking a man from my progeny to attack him. So the first people in Mahdi will fight are Arabs who are under the banner of Islam, but they've erred, gone wrong. They will hear about the Mahdi and they will not agree with him. They, they, they'll say he is not the real one. And they will come from an eastern direction of Mecca. They'll come in with an army to fight Al-Mahdi. An army will come campaigning towards the Kaaba until it reached the Bayda. And Bayda is an expanse of land between Mecca and Medina, a flat desert land. When it reaches there, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, يَخْصَفُ بِأَوَّلِهِمْ وَآخَرِهِمْ The earth will suck them in their first and their last. And in another قول, one person or a couple of people will be left just to tell the tale. So this is one of the signs that this one is the one the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intended. First, that his name will be my name and his na the name of his father will be my father's name. Second, an army will come to attack him and he will be unarmed and the army will be destroyed by Allah alone. So when this happens, realize that this is the one. And the people that realize it initially or the first batch that go towards him is from our lands, from Khurasan. The black flags will rise from the areas of Afghanistan and the flags will come towards him and they will traverse through the land until they come in help of the Mahdi. And his time is a difficult era. The Rasul says it in an eloquence befitting the majesty of the Rasul. Listen carefully, Muslims. You will campaign in the Arab Peninsula and Allah will open it. Prophet said he will fight offsprings of two Khalifas. 
Now, we've had many Khalifas in the past. We've had the Ottoman Empire, we've had the Abbasi, the Fatimi, we've had the Umawi Khilafah, we've had many different. And when he says the offsprings, meaning of them, Allahu Alam, which ones exactly? But the first ones are Arabs. Allahu Alam, they could be of the Abbasi or the Umawi ones. And he said he will wipe them off. And the companions asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what if among those Muslims who fight him are proper Muslims? But they've just erred and they die within that battle like that. What's going to happen to them? Rasul said, every one of them will be gathered on a day of judgment on the intentions they died for. On the intentions they died for. Even if they were the wrong army. Then there will be a campaign against the Persians. For يفتحوا Allah and Allah will open it. Persia those days, today is known as Iran. Then there will be a campaign against Rome and Allah will open it. He called it Al-Malhamatul Kubra. The Prophet ﷺ called it Al-Malhamatul Kubra. And a lot of the scholars say Al-Mahdi will be leading this. Al-Malhamatul Kubra. The gigantic war, the gigantic combat. He will fight the Romans. Ar-Rum. In those days, Ar-Rum had a different name to what we have today. It's a bit difficult to pinpoint them, but our scholars tell us point towards the Europeans. Europeans in general. And Ar-Rum, who are the Byzantines then, are today, today the offsprings are mostly the Europeans and their branches. And at the last campaign, the Muslims will come and the other side, its opposition will come to face it. And the opposition is so huge. 80 banners, 80 different flags. Under each flag, 12,000 men. And when the two sides meet and the Muslims see this, a third of them will run away. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will never accept their repentance ever. Because running away reduces and destroys the morale of everyone standing. So then the campaign starts and the battle is hot in its intense. You will see the flying object or the birds or whatever is flying on the outskirts of this war. It's got nothing to do with the war. It'll drop from the sky. It'll drop. And if some scholars look at it, and you can probably analyze it as being atomical warfare. Gases that make birds and objects in the sky fall. That is flying on the edges. It's got nothing to do with the war. will drop from the sky. This is the hadith of Prophet And a third of the Muslims will die. And a third will be victorious. Just a third will be victorious. And they will be there on the battlefield collecting the remnants and the booty of war. And the hadith says, from one tribe, 99 have died and one person is left. So what joy will he have at victory and what joy will he have at collecting booty? So you would think after such a calamity, after such a colossal engagement, or what is referred to in the books that preceded us as Armageddon, you would have expected issues to become more relaxed. Yet, as they have just become victorious and are collecting the things of the battlefield, a voice will come out to them. Someone calls out and says, Go back to your family and your homes quickly, for a Dajjal has appeared. That, O oh Muslims, the Dajjal has come in your lands. And the first of the Alamatul Kubra, the first of the major signs, is the advent of the Dajjal or the Antichrist. A Dajjal means the liar, the impersonator, one who lies about his impersonation lies about who he represents so he comes and says that he is prophet isa alayhi salam when he first comes out so the imam al-mahdi will send 10 people 10 riders to go and investigate and scout see if the news is correct and the rasul says salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi i know their names and i know the names of their fathers and i know the color of their horses they will be the best riders of the day. So they will go and see, Ah, in the calamity has come. The Dajjal has come. Who is this Dajjal? The first of the big signs of Qiyamah. And understand, when the signs, the major signs are unleashed, they will follow each other like beads on a necklace. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم الآيات أي علامات قَرَزَاتٌ مَنْذُومَاتٌ فِي سِلْكِ فَإِنْ يُقْتَعِ السِّلْكُ يَطْبَعُ بَعْضُهَا بَعْضًا The major signs are like beads on a necklace. When the necklace is cut, one will come after the other. So the Dajjal comes. Let's describe him. A Dajjal is a man. He's a man. He's a human being. The Prophet ﷺ says, the Dajjal has one of his eyes obliterated, like as in wiped out. It is covered. ممسوح العين مكتوب بين عينيه كافر on his forehead is written 
kafir. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam separated it. Ka-fa-ra. Yaqra'uhu kullu mu'min. Every believer can read it, whether he's literate or illiterate. And one eye is wiped out as in it's covered. The second eye is damaged. And the word of the hadith says it has shrunk. And it uses the same word that describes when grapes, you know, shrivel in the sun and become, you know, wrinkly and small. So the, one eye will be covered, the other eye will be like a worn out on old or wrinkly grape. It will be squeezed down. Between his forehead will be written kafir. The Prophet wasallam described him, his hair will be curly, his legs will be arced, he walks a little different. He's stubby, strongly built, and his start or where he comes out from again will be from the area of Khorasan. So the Prophet described the people that will come with him, and he uses the word 70,000 of the Jews of Isfahan. And describing the faces, it resembles the area between Afghanistan and and Iran, some of the inhabitants there, the Prophet says they will have flat faces like the shield and their cheekbones will be raised and their faces will be meaty and they will be wearing cloaks around them. Do the mats! And his first time that he becomes evident will be in the land of the Arabs. And he will travel, he will roam the earth and the hadith says not a village will be missed except he has gone to it and what kalam and subhanallah listen to the ahadith with regards to him the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says listen there is no calamity on the face of this earth from the time of adam till qiyamah come greater than the calamity of the dajjal and there wasn't a prophet that came and accepted he came and warned his people about him and in another hadith, and Nuh warned his people about him. Nuh, very early in human history. At that time, Nuh warned his people about this calamity of the Dajjal. And the Prophet ﷺ says, All prophets warned their people about him. وَأَنَا And I am the last of the prophets. And you are the last of the nations. So he will come from you, there's no way about it. He will come amidst your time. La mahala. There is no exception. It will come in your time. And then he says, the rahmatul muhda, that if he comes, wa ana bayna adhurikum, and I am amidst you, then I will suffice him on your behalf. I will fight him on your behalf. If I am here and he comes, leave him to me. But if he comes and I'm not here, then I leave you to Allah and Allah Rabbul Azza will be your caretaker. And in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, From the time of Adam until Qiyamah, no Amr has come greater than that of the Dajjal. You know, Christians and Jews will be among the first to follow him. They'll actually, the Jews will be the first to follow him because they are waiting for their Messiah to come. They don't believe that Isa Alayhi Salam was it. And they don't want to accept Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they'll be the first to follow a Dajjal. They feel, they say, he is the real Isa. As for the Christians, they believe in the coming of Isa Alayhi Salam. Because they've mixed up their scriptures, they will think that this is the man. And because he will say, I am Isa, they will ask for him, alayhi salam, they will ask for miracles and he will do these miracles. Some of them won't be convinced. See, afterwards he'll say that I am God. Non-Muslim people and the weak Muslims will follow him. The Dajjal will shake Iman to its core. And subhanallah, before he comes, three years will happen like this. And the first year, Allah Rabbul Izza will order the sky to hold back a third of its rain. So a third of the water of the rain will be held back. And the second year, two thirds will be held back. And the third year, there will be no rain. So a drought and famine has already gripped mankind. And then this man comes, the Dajjal. With him, a river of fire and a river of water. And he enters into a village amidst the people. And he says, do you believe in me? I am your Lord. And when they believe, he tells the sky rain and rain comes. Tells the earth, produce your produce. And it will produce its produce. He will go to a dead person, tell a person, a Bedouin, if I bring your parents back to life, would you believe that I am your Lord? He will say yes. He says, rise. And two shayateen will come in the image of his parents and will say, son, listen to him. He's your Lord. 
Do you see Iman is shaken to its core? How do you not believe your eyes? He will tell the earth, spit out your treasures. The hadith says, like bees, gold and silver and diamonds will come out of the ground and follow him. It's difficult times. At this instance, only Iman will see you through. Listen carefully, Muslims. All the faculties and information gathering tools that you have will be deceived. The only thing that you will have left is your hearts. And it is important and I insist regularly work on the hearts. So in the time of the Dajjal, Iman will be shaken to its core. And he will go to another group of people, believe they will say no. So he says, sky hold your water, earth hold your produce, and famine and drought and calamity will befall him. It is so easy just to say, khalas, okay, I believe, let's go, bring it on. That is why it is such a colossal test. And there will be one man who will be able to, who will do something. Rasul says, I know him and he is the best man in, on that day. He will come warning the people saying he is not God. He is not God. He is a Dajjal. He is the Antichrist. And they will say, what are you saying about our Lord? So they'll bring him to him. And he will say, I am your God. Look what I can do. He said, you are the liar. And the Prophet told us about you. So he'll bring a saw and he'll saw him in half. And then he'll walk between the two body parts and the man will come and rise, he'll become alive again. And the Prophet ﷺ told us he'll be able to do that once, just once. And the Dajjal says to him, now do you believe I am God? And he says, now I believe more that you are not God, but you are actually a Dajjal. Because you cannot do this to me again. And truly, he will not be able to do that again. He will throw him into his fire. And Rasul ﷺ tells us he will have something that looks like a fire and something that looks like water. He said it's an illusion. The fire is his water and his water is his fire. Go to the fire to drink from it if you see it. And the man vanishes, disappears. Rasul says, he is the best, he is a real man, the best of men in that day, who tries to call the people away from the worship of a Dajjal. And he will stay and roam the earth for 40 days. The first day will be the length of a year. And look at the Ashab of the Rasul. When he said to them, a day like a year, their concern was, it wasn't what time will I wake up and sleep? Do I sleep for six months, O Prophet? They said, what about Salah, Ya Prophet? How do we pray? If it's, do we pray five times in the whole year? Or, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Uqdiru lahu qadra. Allocate times for it. Replicate the days. So the first day will be like a year. The second day like a month. The third day like a week. Fourth and onwards will be like ordinary days. He will traverse every city and every village except for two places. Makkah and Medina. Allah Rabbul Azza has protected those with angels. He will come towards Medina behind Uhud. Behind Uhud. And he will climb the hilltop with his people. And he will say, do you see that white palace? That white palace of Ahmed. And subhanallah, you look at the pictures of the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From that far and that distance, it looks like a white palace. That is the palace of Ahmed. And he gets down to come towards it and the angel shoes him away. And he turns his face towards Bilad al-Sham. And understand, this is the time of the Mahdi. The Imam is here and the Dajjal has come. And I want to mention the, a story and I'll stick to the English for time reasons. This is the story of Tamim al-Dari. And I will give a general of whom instead of going into it in details. Tamim al-Dari was a Sahabi of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a Christian who became a Muslim and he had an amazing experience. Tamim al-Dari came to the Rasul and narrated a story. Ya Rasul Allah, I was in a ship and the ocean started to become rough and there's 30 other people with me. And the waves, you know, bashed us from pillar to post for a whole month. You know, it's tossing us between waves. And after a month, the waves subsided and we reached near an island and we anchored the ship and took a little boat and came to the island. And at the brink of the island, we saw a creature, the strangest we have seen, covered in hair to the extent that we couldn't tell its front from its behind. And they look at him, imagine the poor guys, you know, a month of, of seasickness. And now here, and they see this creature. So they said, woe be unto you, what are you? So he said, I am Jasasa. So they are hesitant and they say, we thought he's like a devil. So Jasasa said, 
there is a person in that monastery who is longing to see you. Go to him. They said when the beast told us about this man, a man, they said we ran away from the beast immediately thinking it was a jinn or a shaitan or something and ran to this man, to this human being. We entered this hut that was set for worship and suddenly we saw in front of us a person, a man who was the biggest in build that we have yet to have seen. And he was so coarse in his body and in his features, strong and coarse, and big. His arms were wrapped to his neck with chains and his head and arms were also chained together to his knees, to his legs. And he's chained up really well, he couldn't move. Legs and arms and to his neck. We said, what are you? And he said, you are able to hurt me because I'm chained up. So it's my right to ask who are you first so I can ensure my safety. They said, very well. We are people from the Arabs. We rode, we set sail in our ship and a storm hit us until we became lost and landed on this island. We came to this island and we found this beast that came to us that had so much hair on it. We asked it, who are you? And it said to us, I am the spy or the passer of news. And it led us to you. They said, we got afraid of this man and we, did, we didn't feel safe around him. However, the man said to us, tell me about the palm trees of Baisan. Baisan is a city in Jordan. And he wanted to know whether there were palm trees planted in there a lot. We said, what do you exactly want to know about Baisan in Jordan? He said, I ask you, are there more palm trees and have they be filled with dates or not yet? They said, yes, it is full of palm trees and full of dates, more than many other places in, in, in what we know. He said, soon its palm trees and dates will become scarce, will no longer give fruits. Today, really, in Jordan, dates are scarce now. It used to be in history, abundance. Now listen, he said, now explain to me about Buhayr al-Tabariya. It's also close to a sham. They said, what do you want to know about it? He said, does it have water in it? He said, they said, yes, there is lots of water. He said, soon its water is going to go away. It's not going to exist anymore. And truly today, the water has gone drier than before. Then he asked them, he said, tell me about Zagar fountain. And Zagar fountain is uh, somewhere near Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis. Probably about three days journey if you wanted to walk away from Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis. That's where that fountain is. So basically in what we call Israel today. They said, what do you want to know about this fountain? He said, well, is there a large fountain happening and a great river from it? And do people plant a lot of vegetation around it and it gives a lot of water yet? They said, yes, it's all got a lot of water and it's people plant a lot. So then he asks, tell me about the unlettered prophet and Nabiul Ummi. Tell me about Muhammad. Has he come and what is his situation? Yes, he has come. They said he has come out in Mecca and now he lives in Yathrib in Medina. He asked them, have his people fought him? They said, yes. He said, what did he do? They said he was driven out by his own people, but he went to another Arab who are the, the, the Yathrib people and those who embraced Islam with him and they uh, obeyed him. This man said to them, really, has that really happened? They said, yes. He said, أَمَا إِنَّ ذَاكَ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ أَنْ يُطِيعُوهُ He said, behold, it is better for those people who obey him to keep on obeying him. He's actually supporting the Prophet Now I'm going to tell you about myself. As with regards to me, I am the Dajjal. Soon I will be given permission to come out of here. I will be released. And I will traverse the earth from its corner to its corner, not leaving a city or a village behind. And I will roam it for 40 days, a day like a year and so on and so forth. And I will go to every city except for Mecca and Tayyibah. So the Rasul at this time narrating the story hit his member like this. He goes Tayyibah, Tayyibah, this is Tayyibah, Medina is Tayyibah. فَهُمَا مُحَرَّمَتَانِ عَلَيَّ كِلْتَاهُمَا He said, they are both forbidden for me to enter. Now when we say he enters, it means he conquers, takes over, he owns it. كُلَّمَا أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَدْخُلَ وَاحِدِ Because every time I wanted to come into one of them, an angel will stand guard holding a, a sword and he will prevent me from entering Mecca and Medina. He said, and now between the, every two mountains that you can find a pathway entering into, into Mecca and Medina, there are groups of angels standing guarding it right now to the last hour. There are always angels from any, if you're going to enter Mecca or Medina through any pathway through, through mountains, two mountains, there will always be angels within there guarding it, but we cannot see them. Rasul advised us to go there if we can. And if we see him, go in the other direction. We can't fight him. And in another hadith, it describes how he'll, he will be released. 
Subhanallah, Ibn Umar annoyed a person who they used to consider at the time of the Ashab as he might be the Dajjal. So he says, he came and told the story to Hafsa. Hafsa is his sister and the wife of the Rasul. He says, I got him so angry that I saw him fuming like his body is about to explode. If you know, when you go red and you feel like you're expanding. So Hafsa said, Woe be unto you, Ya Ibn Umar. Don't you know that the Prophet said he will be released due to a moment of anger? As in the Dajjal will become angry somehow and he will rip the chains off. Wallahu a'lam. And then he will be released. So then he will roam the world until he comes and the Muslims are under the leadership of Imam Al-Mahdi and understand they don't have the capacity to overcome this challenge. So Muslims are constantly on the back foot until they are locked up and surrounded. In one narration says Bayt Al-Maqdis in one qawl at the base of Jabal Al-Tur. And the Rajih is Bayt Al-Maqdis. They are there and they are surrounded and the Dajjal and his army is outside and the siege lasts. And as the Muslims are in the siege with the Dajjal and uh, the fear is immense, man will tie their wives and their mothers and sisters out of fear that they will run to the Dajjal and fall victim to it. Even in Medina al munawwara when he is camped outside Medina, three earthquakes will hit the city. Everyone will think, oh my God, and run out of the city. So the Prophet said, Allah will purify the city of its hypocrites. And only the true believers will remain. So now the Dajjal after that comes to Bayt al-Maqdis. And the Imam is there. And the Muslims are there. And they're trying to put up a resistance. And at this juncture, at this point, when they are inside this encampment, Allah Rabbul Izzah sends them their solution. And the solution of the Dajjal is Masih, Isa alayhi salam. So listen to, and I will rush through this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Isa, the son of Mary, will descend. How will he descend, Ya Rasul? His hand will be on the wings of two angels. He will be covered in two garbs, both tinged slightly yellow. بيج مهرودتين واضع كفيه على أجنحة ملكين ويا رسول عند منارة بيضاء شرقية دمشق next to the white minaret at the eastern side of Damascus and subhanallah at the eastern door of Damascus there is a white minaret and there is the other one of the Umawi mosque both white minarets, they didn't exist at the time of the Rasul, but now it is there. So Isa will come down in that place. Then he will make his way towards Bayt al Maqdis or Jabal al Tur. And the Ahadith say the Muslims at this stage are thinking what to do. So eventually they come to this consensus. Listen, we can't sit here forever. Let's get out and meet them face to face. So they make this decision at night that tomorrow we will open the doors and go and take this on head on. And Fajr comes, Fajr comes, Salat of Fajr. And the Adhan is given and the lines stand up and Iqama is given. And then Subhan al Khaliq, the day or the area goes dark. The area and the hadith says so that a man cannot see his hand. It will go dark. And then when light comes back, they see in Isa is amidst them. And the Prophet says he will lower his head and you will see like moisture on it as though his hair is wet, but it isn't wet. And when he lifts it, beads roll down his head like liquid, like pearls and they scatter. And he comes to the Salat of Fajr and the Prophet says, what will be your situation when Isa, the son of Mary comes amidst you wa imamukum minkum, and your Imam is amidst you. The Imam is there, Isa alayhi salam. What will be your situation? So listen, the Iqama is given and he notices that Isa alayhi salam comes. So he says, Ta'ala, salli bina, come lead us in Salah. So in one qawl, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Isa alayhi salam will put his hand between the shoulders of the Mahdi and say, Ba'dukum umara ba'd. This is the honor that Allah Rabbul Izza has given this nation. You will lead each other. So remain in your position. So Isa comes down for a different purpose. And he prays behind Al-Mahdi. That's how important Al-Mahdi is. And the qawl of the Ahlul Ilm is, and in another narration he says, the Iqama was given for you. So lead the Salah. And then when the Salah is finished, 
Isa, and the people are ready. Do you understand? They were ready before Isa now for this challenge. That is why when you reach a level, Allah Rabbul Izza will give you a solution. So he says, open the doors. So the doors open. And from afar, the Dajjal sees Isa alayhi salam. The false Messiah sees the real Messiah. And the Hadith says he starts to melt like salt and water. Dissolve like salt and water. And he runs and Isa alayhi salam chases him. And calling he says, it is written that I owe you one strike. I owe you one hit and that will come. So he catches him in the Bab al Lud in Palestine. And in that place, in one narration with a lance and another one with a sword, Isa alayhi salam will strike and show the blood of the Dajjal in his sword. And the hadith says, had he were not to strike, the man would have melted to death. He says to the people, can a God die? Here he is, I've killed him. Because if he melted and vanished, they'll think, oh, God went away. So he kills him to tell them that this is not God. And the Dajjal and the battle with the Dajjal will be finished. And the Muslims have gone through a colossal test. And Isa alayhi salam will come to them and rub their faces out of mercy and kindness and give them the bushara. This is your place in Jannah. This is your place in Jannah. And as this calamity of the Dajjal has just finished, Allah Rabbul Izza will inspire Isa alayhi salam that, O oh Isa, another of my creatures is about to come out and no power on the face of this earth will withstand them and outstand them.